Thank you, Brooke, for the introduction, and thank you, Databricks, for having me. My name is Harrison Chase, CEO and co-founder of LangChain, and I'm really excited to be here. So what is LangChain? LangChain is an open source developer framework for building LLM applications. We started as an open source Python package in October of 2022, right in between Stable Diffusion and ChatGPT. Um, and then we quickly expanded to have a TypeScript package as well. We, we kind of came about right at the time where there was a massive increase in the number of people interested in building applications with language models. And so I think we've been really fortunate to have an amazing community that's helped build uh, with us um, and on top of us. And so I think that's reflected in these numbers are a little bit out of date. We have over 1,000 contributors. And so I'd also just like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who's contributed in part to LangChain. So yes, yeah, that's, that, that's the most important part to clap at. So um, what is LangChain? So I, I think of the value props of LangChain in, in two separate ways. One, we have a lot of components. And these are all the building blocks that are necessary when building LLM applications. And so at the core of LLM applications are the models themselves. And so what LangChain provides is a standard interface for interacting with over 40 different LLM providers, hosters, everything in that, in that spectrum. Um, we also provide tools for managing the inputs and outputs of these LLMs. So at the very basic level, the inputs and outputs are strings. But of course, a lot of people are having more kind of like structured inputs. So you have a bunch of different uh, variables and user inputs and chat history and, and few shot examples that go into this, this, what ends up being a pretty complex input to this LLM. And so we help manage all of that state. And on the opposite end, we have output parsers, which help take the output of the language model, which is a string, and parse it into something that's useful downstream. Because the main, the main way that we see people using LangChain is, is not just to call a language model, but to use it as part of this system. And so that naturally involves connecting it with a lot of other components. And we have a lot of integrations with those other components as well. So document loaders, we have over 125 different places to load documents from and, 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 and then split them into chunks. And this is very important for when you want to connect these general models to your data and enable them to answer questions about, about your company, your personal files. Um, we, we have an integration with uh, over 40 different vector stores, again, all with a standard interface so that you can start with a local vector store and then quickly transition to a cloud vector store when the time, when the time comes. So that's one of the value adds of LangChain, which are these little building blocks, basically, which you can assemble in various ways to build an end-to-end -end application. And then on the other side, we have use case-specific chains. And so we see a bunch of common patterns in how people are building LLM applications. And we put these into chains to do question answering over documentation, question answering over CSV or SQL or, or any type of tabular data as well, adding a natural language layer on top of APIs so you can chat with your data that are behind APIs, um, extraction, so extracting structured information from, from unstructured text, and a variety of others. And so to summarize, LangChain, I think of has two, two value props. One are these individual components, which you can easily use and assemble and, and are, in, are interruptible to build your own applications, and then these chains, which are easy ways to get started. For the rest of the talk, I want to talk about three of the main areas that we're really excited about at LangChain. So the first one that I want to talk about is retrieval. And so the problem that retrieval solves is that language models like uh, GPT only know the data that they were trained over. And so that's useful, and they can answer a lot of questions. But it, when it comes time to using them to answer questions about recent data or your personal data, they, they can't do that by themselves. And so a popular technique for, for allowing them to do that is a technique known as retrieval augmented generation, where you first do a retrieval step, and you provide that information in the prompt and ask the language model to answer based on, on, on that data. And so the benefits here are that you don't need to retrain a model. And so you can use any of the, the commonly available APIs off the shelves. And then this also helps ground the model and reduce hallucinations so it doesn't make things up. So the common workflow that we see for retrieval is when a user question comes in, we first do a similarity search and retrieve from a vector store various docs and various chunks of documents 
that are relevant for that question at hand. And so behind all of this, there's also a separate ingestion process. And this is where the document loading comes in play, where you can load document from, let's say, your Notion. You can then split it into various chunks. And the reason you split it is so that you can then retrieve only the most relevant ones. You then create embeddings, and you put them in a vector store. You then pass them into a prompt and ask the language model to answer based only on that question. And this is, a, this is the standard solution, and it will get you about 80% of the way there. What we've seen and what we're really interested in is advances on top of that, advances that help go from that 80% to a more reliable 95%. And some of the edge cases that pop up that necessitate these advances are things that happen when you have conflicting information or information that changes over time or when you have queries that aren't just about the semantic nature of a document, but also refer to some aspect of the metadata. And so we have a lot of different layers on top of the basic similarity search inside of LangChain to help get started with that. Another area that we're really interested in is agents. And so the, the agents is a bit of an overloaded word. Everyone kind of has a slightly different definition. The one, the one that I like comparing agents to chains is that chains are a sequence of predetermined steps that you have coded in, in code, while agents use the language model as a reasoning engine to determine what actions to take. And then it goes in, and, and does that action, offloading any, any uh, knowledge or computation to that action. It gets back an observation, and then it passes it back in. And so the, the standard solution for an agent is effectively a while loop, where you ask the language model to think about what to do. You then go execute that action. You get back an observation, and you repeat that until the language model recognizes that it's arrived at its final answer or that it's completed its objective. And so, so we have some infrastructure around that. And then we also have various prompting techniques like React, which is a paper that came out last October, it stands for Synergizing, Reasoning, and Acting. And it's, it's designed to more effectively enable language models to think about what to do and take actions. And so we have these as part of the standard solution and standard offering in LangChain. We're also really interested in advances in agents. Agents are one of the most fast-moving spaces, and so we're paying really close attention. I'm really excited by plan and execute style agents, where instead of going one step at a time, you do a planning step. You then execute the first step in that plan, and then you return to the planning step and, and, and kind of adjust the plan from there. And this helps with longer running tasks. And so this was, this was heavily inspired by a lot of work in the open source by, by, by projects like uh, Baby AGI actually, and things like that. Another area that we're paying really close attention to is tool usage. So tool usage involves the language model taking an action. And so this started off where tools were functions that accepted a single input, and that input was just string. And that was because language models back in October were only really good enough to, to input that single string. Now they're getting good enough where they can input more complex structures with multiple function calls. And so we're working to support that and, and push that forward. The last area that we're really excited about is evaluation. And we're excited about this because right now, I think there are a lot of people prototyping, and there's not enough people putting things in production. And I think the gap between prototyping and production exists because it's really hard to get the more complex applications reliable enough to a point where you can trust them in production. And part of that is evaluation and gaining that confidence. And so there's two main issues that we see with evaluation for LLM applications. One is a lack of data. And then one is the lack of evaluation metrics. You don't start with data with a lot of these LLM applications. You start with an idea. And these language models are fantastic zero-shot learners. And you can get started really quickly. But then how do you know how well it's doing? And then on the evaluation metric side, traditional ML metrics like accuracy and MSE don't quite cut it here. And so one of the things that we're working on and, and we're excited to announce in, in a few weeks is a platform to help with this, help with enabling both the collection of data as well as the evaluation of it. And evaluation of it comes in a few different forms. There's, there's traditional metrics, but it's also just making it easier to visualize and understand what's going on. The most common way to evaluate is a vibe check, which, which sounds bad, but it's actually, um, it makes sense that that's the best way because it, it's really complex and, and allowing people to gain that insight as to what's going on is important. And so we want to help with that as well as, as, well as more advanced metrics. We also have a ton of integrations with Databricks. So we support the, the LLM endpoint. We support MLflow. And we have an integration with Spark, both chains and agents, where you can interact with your data. And the best part of all of this is that you can run LangChain 
from inside Databricks. And so that leaves me with the question, we're here. This is, this is a, a generational moment to build things with ML and AI. And so I hope that, that you guys take advantage of LangChain, take advantage of Databricks, and, and what are the amazing applications that you guys are going to build? I'm excited to see. Um, and, and, and please share them. So that's all I've got. Thank you guys for having me. Have a great day. <laughs>